Turok is a truly interesting franchise. It was born from the time when we were trying to figure out what first-person shooters were even supposed to be. In fact, you can argue that Turok 1 has more in line with a collectathon than it does a first-person shooter. Turok 2 refined what the first game did, arguably the best game in the franchise as far as polish is concerned. But in both of these games, you're still traversing huge maps, maps that you will very quickly get lost in, have to do many objectives in, and have to find many keys in. Something happened between Turok 2 and Turok 3. Something big. Gordon, you're alive. Thank God. Get to the surface as soon as you can and let someone know we're stranded down here. Most first-person shooters in the early 2000s took large inspiration from that game. Half-Life really did change the entire genre. Even one of the godfathers of FPS games, Doom, tried to emulate that same kind of experience with Doom 3. Games got slower, more atmospheric, linear. They were focused on immersing the player in that world and telling a story. Turok 3 does the same exact thing. The game got a lot more linear, it became very difficult to get lost, and they wanted to tell a story. However, to say it's exactly like Half-Life would be a bit overselling this. There was one thing that Turok 3 does that separates itself entirely from how Half-Life did it. Cutscenes. There is a lot of cutscenes in this game. In fact, the first 10 minutes or so of the game is just cutscenes. So I guess we'll start there. Let's look at the story. While in the original Turok you could basically ignore it because it might as well not have been there, you definitely can't ignore it in Turok 3. It starts with the main protagonist of Turok 2 getting blasted. And this is kind of ridiculous. It's too late for me. The two of you have to get out of here, now! Joshua! It's that old video game cliche where you eat a million bullets in game, but you get shot once in a cutscene and that's, that's too much, you're dead. I've always hated it when games do this. Thankfully, it doesn't seem to be as common nowadays, but it was real common back then. It's extra egregious because he gets shot and killed by one of the basic enemies that you've killed hundreds of in Turok 2. Anyway, Turok is not a name, it's a responsibility, a mantle. You are a savior of the universe at a galactic scale. Without Turok, things will fall into oblivion. This leaves Joshua Fireseed's sister or little brother to take up that mantle. They're told by the council that if they do not, Oblivion will take over and destroy virtually everything. He's a swallower of worlds, so to speak. So, yeah, everything as you know it may not exist anymore unless you stop it. Not too stressful, don't worry about it. Here you actually have a choice. Do you choose Danielle or do you choose Joseph? There's few gameplay differences between the two. Danielle is the run in guns blazing, whereas Joseph is the stealthy option, but really this doesn't change much. I'll elaborate on that later. Honestly, from this point on, you can kind of just check out of the story. Not a whole lot happens between the beginning of the game and the end. The final cutscenes are the only other ones that are that important. Spoiler warning, by the way, check the chapters down below if you don't want to get spoiled for some reason. It's really not worth worrying about it. I doubt anyone is caring that much to play Turok 3 or really want to know the story about Turok 3 nowadays, but I'll quickly go over the ending because it doesn't make sense to me. It's a bit of a disappointment. The reason I say it doesn't make sense is because you catch up to Oblivion and have the most underwhelming boss fight of all time. I think now I can literally... There we go. Oh, okay, well, that was easy. I thought it would be a lot more than that. This is supposed to be a devourer of worlds. It's supposed to be this galactic threat. Everything will change as we know it. And it's just a pathetic boss fight that I didn't struggle with in any way whatsoever. I'm not asking this boss to be an ultra kill boss, but like, come on. To make things even worse, it turns out to just be this little tiny bug thing that slithers away. This bug eventually goes on to use Joshua Fireseed's body to try to attack you. And once again, this boss is incredibly underwhelming. To prove how underwhelming it is, I'm just gonna play it in full. Here's the whole boss battle. Oh god, I can't slow up this. Oh, yeah, okay.
It's just explosion PNG. So yeah, the story's there. It's not awful. I could follow it and I knew what was going on. But it's pretty underwhelming. Give me a month or so and I guarantee you I'll have forgotten almost all of it. But at the risk of sounding too negative, I'll counter that with a positive. This is a Night Dive remaster. And it's really good, like all of the remasters. I love Night Dive Studios. They bring back childhood favorites and make them accessible to today's generations. I don't know if they really wanted to play Duroc 3, but here you go. I didn't have any problems with this remaster. It had all the settings I wanted it to have. Resolution was there, FOV change was there, whatever frame rate I wanted was there, including uncapped, which is pretty amazing for an N64 game. And that's something I really gotta bring up. The original game is... It's not good looking. It pushed the N64 to its absolute limit. It also ran really poorly, which is the biggest problem. Now, for an N64 game, it definitely did look good, don't get me wrong, but I would rather have the game be playable. And now it is. This is by far the best way to play Turok 3. So, if you haven't and you wanted to, then go play Turok 3. With one really big caveat. This game is kind of overpriced in my opinion. The remake is $30. $30 for a very short campaign. You will beat it in one sitting. It will only take you three hours at most. Now with two characters to play as, you could stretch that to six hours with a repeat playthrough, but I wouldn't care enough to play it again, to be honest. So I don't know, I don't think this is worth 30 bucks. To make things even worse, there's no multiplayer. Now, to be frank, I think multiplayer is an afterthought when it comes to Turok. Is it fun? Yes. Do most people buy Turok to play the multiplayer? No. I'd be willing to bet the vast majority of players don't care at all. Some really do, like this guy right here. I can understand being a little upset, but shitty behavior? Like, that's just a little too far, no. Regardless, even though I don't really care about the multiplayer too much, having the multiplayer would be able to make it easier to justify $30 for this game. There has to be some licensing issues somewhere. There's no reason this should be 30 bucks. By now, you're probably wondering, Jarek, what are you doing sitting in a hot tub that's clearly too small for you? Usually when you play a dinosaur game, you find a world with dinosaurs. So where's the dinosaurs? Well, I would ask a question to you. The same one, in fact. Where's the dinosaurs? There's barely any in Turok 3, so I said, screw it, I guess I don't need to be in a world with dinosaurs either. Seriously though, there's two types of dinosaurs total in the entire game. A raptor and a combi. And these basically only show up in one area. They're very rare elsewhere. You don't even see a dinosaur till about an hour in. Come on, this series started as a Turok Dinosaur Hunter and you don't have dinosaurs. Dragon T-Rex mad, give me dinosaur. Okay, the enemies do have a decent amount of variety, but still it doesn't feel like they have as much variety as the first two games. In fact, some of these enemies kind of almost feel like reskins of earlier enemies. For example, on the first level you fight against these enemies that throw this green goop at you. Later on you'll find these enemies that throw that same green goop at you. It's the same attack, they're different enemies, but they feel more or less the same. But I will give Turok 3 some credit here. From level to level, they look different. It helps break up the monotony. And some levels do have different enemies. Like this entire lava world has enemies unique to that lava world. And they're pretty cool looking. You'll even go back to the original first Turok 1 level. And that's pretty cool seeing it in higher res. Like, yeah, we got the remaster of Turok 1, but still, graphically it looks a bit better here. And this is where I want to point out the raptors. The animations are smoother, the death animations are smoother, their attacks are faster, in general they're just better. Which makes it even more disappointing that we just don't have any more dinosaurs! Anyway, going back to your character selection choice between Danielle and Joseph. Like I said, Danielle is the guns blazing type character. She gets a grappling hook that is rarely ever used, and a couple of different weapons. Whereas Joseph gets night vision goggles and will have to crawl through vents. Occasionally the levels will split, and you play a different section of the level depending on the character you choose. For example, on the first level, Danielle just goes around in the streets shooting anything she wants. Meanwhile, Joseph has to play spy and go through all these lasers. Personally, that doesn't seem very fun to me, I'm not much of a stealth guy anyway, so I have no reason to replay through the game. Like I said, you do get different weapons depending on the characters, but not enough to really change things up significantly. The idea was to give you an incentive to replay through the game, but it just doesn't offer enough to do that. Especially because the game itself is incredibly linear. Remember when I said this game was taking inspiration from Half-Life 1? Well, gone are these big sprawling maps you can get lost on, in are these linear maps that are story driven. That in itself is not a negative thing. If I'm going to be honest, I much prefer that. I don't really like the sprawling level design of the first two games. Getting lost isn't fun, nor is key hunting, it's just boring. Whereas Half-Life 1 is a ton of fun. 
If you do linear right, it's really good. Eh, this game doesn't do it awful, but not really great either. The first level is kind of onto something. You can definitely feel the Half-Life experience. Some of these sections are almost horror-like and really similar to that of the Black Mesa areas in Half-Life 1. Follow me! It's right up here! An NPC can actually climb a ladder. Hurry, we can get up to the... But the actual combat is pretty simple. Just shoot things with a pistol or shoot things with a shotgun. In general, talking about the gameplay in this game is kind of difficult because there's not really much to say. It's a linear shooter. I mean, by now you've played these before. And that's kind of concerning because I don't have any huge criticism nor any huge praise. It's kind of just your run of the mill shooter, which is bad because that means it's really forgettable. I guess I could talk about the weaponry. That's something Turok usually specializes in. But in this case, I found myself pretty much only using four basic weapons and very little of my arsenal. At the start, I used the pistol to snipe things. Eventually, I started using the assault rifle for that purpose because it's burst fire and just as accurate. The assault rifle will eventually get replaced with one of the best miniguns I've seen, so I'll give it that. And we're in a boss battle. There you are. Oh my lord. All right, so I think the minigun is pretty effective. You'll get a pump action double barrel right off the bat. And this I'll definitely give some praise. This thing feels and sounds amazing. N64 gun, everybody, really good. But those were the four guns I used for 90% of the game. And none of them are really interesting. They're pretty basic guns. One of them even got replaced and I stopped using it entirely. It's extra frustrating because some of these other weapons are interesting. Like the vampire gun. This weapon hurts you if you don't hit an enemy with it, and if you do hit an enemy with it, well... Oh. Oh my god. <laughs> what is this weapon? <laughs> It's not useful in any way whatsoever, to be honest, but that's a thing. And of course, the ever wonderful Cerebral Bore comes back. Granted, now the projectile fires really slow, so it's not as useful. That's still just so brutal. The only other weapon I ended up using a lot was this glaive looking thing, which was a lot of fun to use. It functioned like a boomerang, you throw it, and it would kill pretty much anything it hit, then come back to you. This did cause some weird jank. Oh, there you are. Oh my god. <laughs> that actually is a pretty decent amount of damage. Oh my god. <laughs> it was not supposed to do that. But well, that just made it even more fun to use. However, the biggest problem with this weapon is that it doesn't require ammo to use meaning you're going to be using it a lot throughout the last level because this game doesn't give you enough ammo. I used pretty much just the glaive exclusively on this final level, which is frustrating because these enemies can block the glaive. Give me more ammo. I want to use my other guns. In fact, this last level kind of just sucked in general. It looked really boring, great corridors, same two enemies over and over. Not really much more to say about it. The one last thing I will talk about are the bosses. This is pretty obvious they were inspired by Half-Life here as well, because the bosses usually have a little trick to beating them. Yeah, at first they start out as just a boss to shoot a bunch until it dies, but then you have to do something else, some clever way to kill it. The ways to kill these bosses were usually really straightforward and didn't require much brain power, but it's neat to have a little bit of a change. Unfortunately, most of these bosses were really easy and I didn't struggle on any of them. I didn't think twice about any of them. I just breezed right through. Again, I'm not looking for ultra kill here, but they're supposed to be bosses, right? Like I should have to do more than autopilot. So that's Turok 3. Could I recommend it? Well, I could not recommend it. It's not an awful game, it's just not a great game. I think it's outshined by both Turok 1 and 2. Is it worth the $30 they're asking for the remake? Definitely no, I would say not. 
And big thanks to my YouTube members for supporting this channel. They get to see my videos early, sometimes months ahead of time if I'm really working my ass out to post out videos. If you enjoy this content, consider subscribing. Consider you're watching this late on. You might like more of my content. So check out my videos right there. There's some other videos, I think, or at least YouTube thinks you'll like them anyway. Uh, if you want to subscribe, do that up there. If you want to follow my Twitch, I stream every single week. You can do that right there. If you want to follow my Twitter, it's Jarek underscore Dragon. It's still Twitter, it's not X. 